Welcome to today's panel discussion, the Cyrus Cylinder, Uses, Misuses, and Contemporary Iran, co-sponsored by the Asia Society of Northern California and the Asian Art Museum. My name is Deborah Clearwaters. I'm the Director of Education and Interpretation here at the museum. It's a great honor to host the Cyrus Cylinder exhibition and to see all of you come and spend the afternoon with us today. Thank you for being here. I'd like to acknowledge some people without whom we could not have presented this incredible uh, exhibition. The exhibition, The Cyrus Cylinder and Ancient Persia, A New Beginning, was organized by the British Museum in partnership with the Iran Heritage Foundation. I also want to thank our local sponsors, who've been very generous in um, helping us present the exhibition here in San Francisco. And they are Tina and Hamid Mogadam, Bita Dariabari and Dr. Reza Malik, and Paya, the Public Affairs Alliance of Iranian Americans. Thanks to all of you. Our gratitude also goes out to the Asia Society of Northern California, our co-sponsor today and a wonderful partner um, always. And I'd like to invite Wendy Soon Broder, Broder to um, Director of Global and Corporate Development and Strategic Partnerships to say a few words on behalf of the Asia Society. Wendy? Thank you, Deborah. Good afternoon, and I also want to thank you all for coming, and we'd also like to thank the Asian Art Museum for hosting the program and being such an important co-sponsor and partner of ours. I uh, also want to mention that Jay Shu is on our board at the Asia Society. And uh, we also want to mention our uh, co-promotional uh, sponsors today, and that's UC Berkeley uh, Department of East Eastern Studies and the San Francisco State University Persian Studies Program. And so we hope you enjoy the program today. And if you aren't members of either the Asian Art Museum or the Asia Society, we encourage you to join. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. It's now my honor to introduce the curator of the exhibition, John Curtis, who is the British Museum's keeper of special Middle East projects. Um, and I will say that I'm going to be very brief in all of the introductions today. You do have in your on your chair uh, more extended biographies of all of our panelists today. So I hope you'll forgive me if I don't um, go into much depth in the interest of allowing more time for the discussion. Uh, Mr. Curtis's main in research interests concern the archaeology and history of Iran and Iraq between 1000 and 330 before the Common Era, and please join me in welcoming Mr. Curtis. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to say to start with um, what a very great pleasure it is to be here um, with the exhibition, which I hope you'll all have a chance to see shortly um, if you haven't done um, already. Uh, and I would like to just um, express particular thanks to the people uh, who've made uh, possible this uh, tour of the Cyrus Cylinder here in San Francisco. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Director Jay Shu and curator, uh, curators uh, Forrest McGill and Kama Adamji. And the tour was actually developed um, with the help and assistance of the Iran Heritage Foundation. Uh, and I'm pleased that uh, Mr. Ali Reza Rastagar, the chairman of IHF America, um, is with us this afternoon. Um, I did actually have a um, prepared text, but um, I think it's slightly longer than the 20 minutes I've been allocated, so I think it might be rather better uh, if I just ab lid. So uh, I hope you'll forgive me uh, if from time to time I trip up a little bit. Um, well, this is the uh, Cyrus Cylinder uh, itself, sometimes described as being um, about the size of an American football. Um, it was found um, in uh, Babylon, um, which was uh, now part of Iraq, but then, of course, um, a part of um, Ottoman Turkey. Um, and it was buried uh, on the orders of Cyrus the Great uh, as a foundation, description, uh, a foundation inscription after he captured Babylon in 539 uh, BC. First of all, of course, Cyrus had campaigned in Turkey 
um, defeated uh, Croesus, captured Sardis, and then in 539, he turned his attention um, to Babylon. Um, according to the uh, cylinder, uh, Cyrus uh, entered the city, um, well, sorry, and I'll just uh, describe first the circumstances um, of the discovery. Um, it was found in British Museum excavations um, at um, Babylon in 1879. These excavations um, were conducted by Hormuz Rassam, who's a native of uh, Mosul in northern Iraq. He was a Chaldean Christian, um, and he'd received his early archaeological training um, with Austin Henry Layard at the famous uh, Assyrian sites of Nimrud and Nineveh. Um, now, in um, various accounts, Rassam says that he found the cylinder at the south end of the Umran uh, mound. This is just down here where it's marked on the map Umran um, mounds. Uh, and in another place, he said, in another source that is, he says that the cylinder was found near the village of Jumjuma. Now it so happens that the village of Jumjuma, which is marked DD down there, is actually um, very close to the southern end of the uh, Umran Mound, so we can be fairly confident that that was where um, the cylinder was actually found. And interestingly, Cyrus does talk in the cylinder about uh, restoring two of the walls of Babylon. He talks about restoring the uh, inner city wall, which is called Imgur Enlil, and he also talks about restoring the key wall, which is probably running um, down there. In fact, the bed of the, Euph the Euphrates, the river, has now shifted its course. Its ancient course came down there. So in fact, um, this is that point um, just here, is the junction of the key wall and the inner city wall, and it's probably uh, exactly there that the cylinder was found. Um, now, some of you will know, of course, that um, in 2003, uh, Babylon was made uh, into a military camp, um, Camp Alpha, it was known, and a certain amount of damage was caused at that time. But in fact, uh, the place where the cylinder was found uh, is right down here, uh, well outside the area of the military camp. So. When it was found, um, the cylinder um, was actually uh, broken, oh sorry, not when it was found. When it arrived in the British Museum, the cylinder was broken um, in pieces. We don't know um, whether it got broken during the course of excavation uh, or whether it was broken deliberately after it was found because at that time um, uh, workmen were given backshish for their uh, rewards for their discoveries and obviously they would have been given more for three pieces than for one piece. So it might have been at that time that it got broken uh, and in fact there's a small fragment of the cylinder here uh, which is um, now in the, belongs to the old Babylonian um, collection. Um, and a cast of that piece um, is fixed to the cylinder uh, in the exhibition, uh, as you will see. Well, there's about one third um, of the cylinder uh, missing um, altogether. So what does it say? Well. Um, it describes first how uh, Cyrus was instructed by the Babylonian god Marduk to go to Babylon and depose the reigning Babylonian king um, Nabonidus, who was felt to have neglected um, his religious duties. So it says that Marduk took Cyrus by the hand, etc., etc., and led him to Babylon. As I've said also, um, it does describe how he did restoration work in Babylon, um, restoring some of the walls. But what are the features about the Cyrus Cylinder um, which makes it so special and so well known? Well, first of all, 
Cyrus says that he entered Babylon peacefully. Now that's an unusual thing uh, in itself because it was customary at that time, uh, certainly for the uh, preceding Assyrian and Babylonian kings, um, to destroy places and burn them to the ground as soon as they had occupied them. He didn't do that, and the archaeological record um, also um, bears that out. No, no trace of a destruction level at this date um, at Babylon. Secondly, Cyrus says that he absolved, uh, uh, absolved the inhabitants of Babylon from the forced labor obligations which had been imposed upon them by the previous um, Babylonian kings. We don't exactly know what that means, but uh, presumably um, the inhabitants of Babylon had been forced to uh, undertake, uh, to spend a certain amount of their time um, doing, uh, undertaking particular um, labor duties, and they were now um, absol absolved from those. Uh, thirdly, and most significantly, um, he talks about sending back um, to shrines in Mesopotamia and southwest Iran um, statues of gods which had been removed by the Babylonian kings. And this is usually taken to mean that by sending back, to the, sending back the god statues, um, Cyrus is certainly allowing uh, and possibly even promoting uh, the practice of different types of religion in all of those places. Fourthly, uh, he talks um, about also sending people back to the shrines for where the god statues uh, are being sent. And these are uh, peoples who had been deported by the previous Babylonian kings, particularly um, Nebuchadnezzar and Nabonidus. There's now a fifth reason for regarding the cylinder as a very special document, and that is the discovery of um, two small fragments of um, tablet in 2000, uh, right at the end of 2009 and the beginning of 2010 in the British Museum collections. And these fragments of tablet um, either come from Babylon um, or from a nearby site and um, they have on them exactly the same text as the Cyrus cylinder. So these demonstrate that the Cyrus cylinder was very probably some kind of um, a proclamation. It could be argued that these tablets, this tablet is a copy or a file copy of some kind um, or a prototype, but I think um, that that's rather unlikely. And we do in any case have evidence for Persian kings um, issuing proclamations. There's um, Darius's great inscription at Bisitun near Kamanshah uh, in western Iran, uh, in which he talks about copies uh, of the inscription being sent to um, different parts of the empire. Um, we've got um, actually evidence um, of that uh, in the form of a stele at Babylon, uh, on the reverse of which is a copy of part of the Bisatun inscription, uh, and there's also a parchment from Elephantini um, in, uh, in Egypt. Um, well, I've cited then um, five reasons uh, why the Cyrus Cylinder should be considered um, as a very special um, document. Now, uh, critics and cynics will argue that it's nothing very much more than a standard um, Assyrian or Babylonian um, building uh, inscription. Um, it's certainly true, of course, that it's written in Babylonian um, by a Babylonian scribe, but one would uh, expect it to have been. Um, there's no doubt that it must have been written um, uh, according to the um, orders um, of Cyrus. It is true that um, some parallels can be found in earlier Babylonian and Assyrian documents. Uh, in particular, um, there's a cylinder of the Assyrian king Esarhaddon in which he talks about um, sending back uh, god statues. But what he doesn't do, uh, and this is rather significant, I think, he doesn't talk actually about sending back um, deported, uh, deported peoples. We've also got 
the evidence um, of the Bible and classical authors that um, uh, this is a rather uh, special document. Um, we've got a long description in the second book of Chronicles and in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah um, about the Jewish people being sent back to Jerusalem um, by Cyrus to uh, rebuild um, the temple. Uh, and it's clear that this event must have happened um, at, the, uh, at the same time, more or less, um, as his um, capture of, uh, of Babylon. Um, he's very highly regarded, of course, in the Bible. He's called uh, in the book of Isaiah, the Messiah, the Lord's uh, anointed. Uh, and also, um, Cyrus uh, receives very favorable treatment um, by the classical uh, authors. Um, Herodotus, to start with, and then more particularly by Xenophon, uh, who makes um, Cyrus the subject um, of a sort of um, political romance um, which describes the ideal king. And this tradition um, of, uh, of uh, eulogizing Cyrus actually has lasted up to the present day. And of course, um, as many of you will know, um, Thomas Jefferson even had two copies of the uh, Cyropedia. Um, well, we actually, I have to say, shouldn't make too much um, out of the uh, claim that um, Cyrus was promoting religious um, tolerance. Um, we're not quite sure what his own religion um, may have been. Um, later, Achaemenid kings pay tribute to Ahura Mazda, and for that reason are called usually Mazda worshippers. We don't know um, whether um, they were Zoroastrians in the sense that they knew about the um, reforms of the prophet um, uh, Zoroaster. Uh, my own uh, view is that Cyrus probably was um, a Mazda worshipper, believed in the ancient Iranian um, uh, religion with its head god of um, Ahura Mazda. Um, but he was also perfectly happy um, to pay lip service to other gods. We've already talked about Marduk, and in this brick inscription, which is in the exhibition, um, he talks about the uh, Babylonian moon god, um, Sin. And I think um, it's important to remember that there wasn't any tradition, actually, at this time uh, of a state imposing its religion uh, on a conquered people. So the Assyrian and Babylonian kings um, didn't do that. And it wasn't, in fact, until the Sasanian period that um, the uh, ruling elite uh, attempted to export their religion um, abroad. Nevertheless, um, the cylinder is, I think, a, a very, very remarkable um, and uh, unique document. It does demonstrate um, some break with the past. And probably, in a way, uh, we ought to see it uh, as some kind of charter for how to um, govern a, a vast empire. In the space of just 11 years, um, Cyrus um, uh, expanded his uh, empire to include uh, really the whole of the, of the Middle East from uh, the Aral Sea to um, North Africa. Uh, and he had to find um, a good way of um, governing all of these different and diverse peoples. And he did so, uh, I think, by compromise rather than by confrontation. Um, Cyrus himself, I just was asked to say a few words about uh, his own capital city. Cyrus himself founded a capital city uh, or major city at uh, Pasargadi there um, quite late um, in his reign. Um, it was actually excavated in the 1960s by Professor David Stronach, who I think might be with us um, uh, today. And Cyrus was eventually um, buried there uh, in 530 in this splendid um, gabled tomb. Well, the cylinder, as I say, was found in 1879. It was first translated by Theophilus Pinches on the left and published by Henry Rawlinson on the right. But there was no idea at that moment um, uh, that it uh, was going to acquire the sort of notoriety that it actually later did. I have to say its importance was recognized um, immediately because the tradition of Cyrus um, was uh, well known, but it didn't start being called um, the first uh, Charter of Human Rights uh, until, I believe, 1967 um, by, his, by the Shah in his book, um, The White Revolution. 
then as is well known, the, um, the cylinder became the symbol um, of the uh, 2,500 year celebration um, of Iranian monarchy that was held um, at Persepolis in 1971. Um, it was loaned very briefly to Iran by the British Museum at that time when it was buried, uh, sorry, it was um, exhibited at the base um, of the uh, Shah Yad monument on the outskirts of Tehran. Uh, and the cylinder featured um, on stamps, um, on medals, uh, and on coins. Um, also, in, it, it was uh, it reappeared on coins a few years later in um, 19, 1973, and rather surprisingly, it's also adopted um, as an icon by the Islamic Republic of Iran and appeared on um, uh, Iranian stamps in uh, 2005. Then, um, in 2010-11, for five months, um, the British Museum lent the um, cylinder um, to Iran. That was partly in recognition of the very generous loans made to the British Museum for two big exhibitions that we'd had on the Persian Empire and on um, Shah Abbas. And one entire room on the, in the upstairs uh, uh, of the museum was turned over to the um, exhibition. Uh, and the exhibition even extended to the outside of this museum with um, uh, the shops and so on in the museum gardens. Um, and at the opening, the opening ceremony was attended by um, President Ahmadinejad, his advisor, Mr. Uh, Mashai, and the head of the uh, antiquities organ, the cultural organization. Uh, Mr. Bagai, and there, were, there was great excitement. It was seen by up to half a million people, um, and there were uh, quite lengthy um, celebrations. But um, very interestingly, um, at this time, um, the cylinder was um, presented um, not so much as um, a document of um, human rights, but actually a document promoting um, Iranian nationalism. And um, a lot of the um, accompanying um, presentations um, did actually uh, focus on, uh, on that aspect of it. Uh, and this plaque here records the fact that the cylinder um, was exhibited there um, in, uh, in Tehran. Um, as you see, um, the National Museum of Iran, etc. You can read that um, for yourselves. So I'd like to um, conclude by um, saying that um, uh, whatever might have been said about it in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, the Cyrus Cylinder um, is a very, very remarkable document, uh, and it does, in terms of ancient Near Eastern history, uh, usher in a new period, um, a new era, uh, that is the time of the Persian Empire, and that does represent um, a very clear uh, break uh, with past tradition. Thank you.